You know, my father was born in a prison in West Virginia. You and I can't fully appreciate the myriad ways in which that shapes and molds, especially a young black man growing up in the South in the 1950s. So, you know, it, it wasn't a total surprise when he developed addiction issues, when he had trouble being a father. He hadn't seen it. He didn't have a relationship with his father. So these ideas that I had created about the kind of dad he should be, he wasn't capable of it. You probably recognize Craig Melvin as a seasoned journalist and the co-host of The Today Show on NBC. But what you might not know is that he had to navigate addiction and generational fatherlessness in his own family to get there. Craig documents this tumultuous journey in his book, Pops, including how he learned to become a better father himself in the process. Now, he uses his TV platform to celebrate fatherhood with his Dad's Got This series. As parents, we all want to be the best versions of ourselves for our kids, regardless of our own family circumstances. And Craig Melvin accomplished exactly that. Craig, welcome to Dad Saves America. John, thank you. This is beautiful. What a beautiful setup you've arranged. Thank know, you for allowing awesome? me into your home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways, what you're doing on your show uh, predates what we're doing with Dad Saves America, and I feel like we're sort of brothers in arms trying to celebrate fatherhood. Yes, yes, you know? we are. And don't you think it's high time that we start celebrating the modern dad? Well, this is the thing that I think is so exciting about what you're doing with Dad's Got This. We need positive role models. Yeah. And I feel like we don't have them. What, how do you think about that? How do you think about the, the image of dad in popular culture? You're a media guy. Well, I, it's funny you bring that up because that was part of the impetus for, for the series uh, on the Today Show. Oftentimes, when fathers are portrayed, it's Homer Simpson. Yeah. Or, or, or if you're a family guy, Peter Griffin. Uh, or uh, a, a, in, a, part of that ilk, in that same vein, dad's this bumbling doofus, not really that bright. Al Bundy. Right, right, you know, they're not really uh, fully engaged in the lives of their children. And, and it bothered me, and it still bothers me. Um, but I thought a couple years ago, I was like, you know, I have this platform, you know, the Today Show typically gets watched by a few million households every morning. Why don't we start using the megaphone, the platform to shine a light on the good that fathers are doing? And it's, you know, it's, I, I have been pleasantly surprised by the response. And I think part of the reason the response has been so favorable is because there, there was such a void. So kudos to you as well for using uh, the platform to shine a light on, 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 on dads doing, doing well. You've got this great new book, Pops, and um, you paint a picture of, of a family history that has a lot, of, a lot of challenges in it, right? And I mean, your relationship with your dad, but even predating mm -hmm. your father, your father's birth, your yeah. grandmother, tell me about that. Well, you know, it's, um, years ago, I was taking a, um, a, a journalism class and the professor, I uh, was talking about interviewing, and, and we went through a list of questions that you could always use as crutches in an interview that typically elicit a pretty compelling response. And one of the questions was, um, how much money? What's, what's the most money you've ever wasted? And anytime you ask someone, like, what's the most money you ever wasted? There's going to be a pretty good story there. And I'm so, taking notes on this. Well, I'm taking I, notes. <laughs> and so when I started interviewing my dad for the book, it's awkward to interview your father. Uh, as you might imagine, and especially about uh, some sensitive subject material. And at first I was pretty nervous. And so I decided I would use that question to, to sort of break the ice. And so I started with, so Pops, what's the most money you ever wasted? And he thought about it. Um, and he said, $1,600, 1986. I was like, wow, that's, Very precise. <laughs> it's like, that's a lot of money. And clearly there's a great story here because you remember the year. Um, so I'm like, well, what was the $1,600 for? He's like, that's how much it cost to put my father in the ground. I was like, oh. oh. Um, and from there, um, we spent a, a fair amount of time talking about his own childhood and how he didn't really have a relationship with his father at all. And then all of a sudden he gets a call from his, his aunt one day 
His dad's died, and they need help burying him. And so my father, who had had this contentious relationship with his dad, um, has to go in and, and, and pay for the funeral. And it always stayed with him. Um, he, my, my dad didn't know who his father was until he was 12 or 13. There was this guy that used to kind of hang around, and he sort of looked like him, and finally he worked up the, uh, the audacity to, to just ask him. And my he had dad, to ask him, are oh, you yeah. my dad? Are you my dad? This guy, and so he didn't live in the house. No, 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 no. Curtis Amaker uh, was my grandfather's name, and um, he, did, he never lived in the house. Um, did not have much of a, of a relationship with, with my grandmother after uh, my father was born. And so it became glaringly obvious pretty on, pretty early on during the conversation with my dad, like, he didn't have a relationship with his father. So these ideas that I had created about the kind of dad he should be, he wasn't capable of it. And I didn't realize that until I was in my early 40s. You know, here I was angry at my dad for being mediocre at best. And it, it becomes pretty apparent that my, my expectations for him and of him were unrealistic. John, you, you can't expect someone to be something that they haven't seen. It's, it's a wholly unrealistic expectation. I think oftentimes we do that, especially with dads and moms as well, but you expect someone to, to, to be something that they haven't seen emulated in front of them. You know, it's one thing to, to, to watch, you know, Cliff Hux, Huxtable and the Cosby Show, but it's another thing to, to experience that. But even before that, you know, my dad, the first line in the book is, you know, my father was born in a, in a prison in West Virginia. You know, you and I can't fully appreciate um, the myriad ways in which that, that shapes and molds, especially a young black man growing up in the South in the 1950s. And, and so, and it manifested itself throughout my father's life. And he didn't fully appreciate that until he was much older. So, you know, it, it wasn't a total surprise when he um, developed addiction issues, when he had trouble uh, being a father. He hadn't seen it. You know, th this is this thing that I think is so interesting about, um, when we, we, we don't, I think, talk about how we come to know the things we know. Like, you know, there's experience, I feel like there's three paths. There's, there's firsthand experience. Yes. There's um, modeling. Yes. What you're talking about. Like, so we see other people live the life. And then there's storytelling. Yes. Which is like this interesting, pretty, it can be pretty close to the modeling. If you've got good stories, mm -hmm. you can find a, a path forward, even if you don't have people flesh and blood. You know, the Bible is a storytelling book. You're right. And um, you're a man of faith. You've mm -hmm. talked about this. You know, how did faith play a role in, in, in your childhood when you, you know, you have this father who's there, but as you've said, is sort of like intentionally absent? Yes. Well, uh, to be clear, um, my, my dad uh, did not go to church on Sundays. Um, if we saw my father in church, if someone had died or someone was getting married. Uh, and he, he didn't make it to all the weddings and funerals. Uh, but my mother, uh, more than made up in, in, <laughs> in terms of her faith development. Uh, she grew up in the church. Um, my grandpa, you know, everyone grew up in the church. I'm, a, I'm you know, I'm from South Carolina. I'm a Baptist guy. Um, and I'm Catholic, so you have a much more fun procession. Well, <laughs> I, my, 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 wife's, my wife's Catholic. And I remember the first time I went to mass with her. And we, were, we were out of there in like 35 minutes. I was like, I, no wonder you're Catholic. This is a pretty good gig. <laughs> Go to 12 o'clock. Then, you know, you get the long, you get the long version. But long for you guys is like, you know, like an hour. <laughs> That's true. Um, so, no, I mean, growing up, John, and my, my brother and I joke about it now, and my mother jokes about it with us, but at the time it was no laughing matter. I mean, we would go to church for, you know, Sunday school started at like 10.30. And the service started at 11. And we were usually there until 1. And usually a couple times a month there was a service after that. Like there was an afternoon service that right. we would go back for. And then th during the week there was choir practice because, of course, I was in the choir. Um, you got a good voice for choir. Well, did, they, did, did you get recruited into I, the choir? I, no, I didn't have a choice. I, I, it was like I was drafted. 
uh, at a certain age, you know, I, you were in the choir. There was no discussion about it. Um, but I, there was a comedian years ago, and it, it really resonated with me. I remember this, this bit he used to do, because he grew up in similar circumstances, and one Sunday he'd been in church for like six hours, and he looks up at his grandmother, and finally he says to her, he said, Grandma, just, just let me go to hell. <laughs> it, it can't be as bad as this. And I, that's how I grew up. I grew up the same way. I, there's some Sundays. And I remember thinking, my God, if this is what it takes to get to heaven, I, I may be up for the alternative. Because I just assumed everyone else worshipped like that. And as I got older, I discovered that I was, was in the minority. But, but what it did do, what I did not fully appreciate until I got older and I started having struggles of, of my own, um, it, it helped me develop a foundation of faith. And you, you don't realize sometimes what your parents are doing until you get older and you become a parent yourself. Yeah. But my mother knew that I was going to need, at some point in my life, this, this faith foundation. Uh, and I, I, I would say I probably, um, as they would say in the, in the Baptist church, I went astray. I was in the wilderness for a number of years. From a faith perspective. From a faith perspective until... Um, I started working in, in Columbia, South Carolina in my early 20s, and I, I returned to the church. And it is very much a part of, of who I am now. And we're very active, at, my wife and I, at our church. And our, our ch my kids will probably say the same thing about me one day. Like, oh, my God, Dad made us go to, to church for an hour and a half on Sundays. Um, but little do they know that they go to church about half as much as I did. But, but they're there every, every Sunday uh, sitting in the back. There's this really interesting statistic about about dads and and um, participation in church, like formal, like going going to ma mass or church, and that is, I think, so goes dad, so goes the kids. Mm -hmm. So you had your mom, which was awesome, yeah. but for the like at the macro level, my understanding is you don't see the declines in church participation in families where dad goes to church. church. I've, I've I've seen some of that research, um, which is one of the reasons that that we do it. You know, I do what we don't do. Now wait, so which mass do you go to though? Do you like switch well, we, it between the Catholic it's, mass it's and a funny, Baptist? Funny What's the that. deal here? So my wife will take them to, to Catholic mass probably once a month. And we go to a congregational church in our town every Sunday, um, which is, which they enjoy more because <laughs> well, <of course. laughs> there's, there's, there's a playground and they get to leave the service and go hang out with the other kids for, for, for Sunday school during the actual worship service. Yeah, for me, we don't, we're not like trying to rear good Catholics or trying to rear good Baptists or even good Christians necessarily. What we are trying to do very deliberately, um, my wife and I have talked about this, we, we are, are intentionally trying to introduce them to the, just, just the concept of belief and faith. Um, because what I have found, um, especially in these times, that when terrible things happen in life, and terrible things will happen to everyone, or when you lose a loved one, or you get that cancer diagnosis, or you lose the job, you've gotta have something to, to fall back on and, and believe in, and help guide you through uh, the tumult of life. That's what my faith has always done. And, it, and it, it, it's also helped me to try and make sense of things that are completely nonsensical. You know, it's funny because we are in this strange time, right? We've got AI and we've got all these things that sort of challenge the way we understand the world. I feel like we're on the verge of maybe a, a, a revival in a lot of ways because there's so many people who are searching for meaning, for purpose, for some kind of void that they can feel. And yes. I, th I think the absence of, of dad, especially in American culture, um, has, has played a big, pretty big role in that. I think you're right. Um, and I, I, would, I would maintain as well, John, that you know, part of what church does, and when I, when I use the term church, I'm, I, it's the umbrella church, whatever your faith yeah, is. services. Yeah, I, it, it provides a sense of community, uh, a sense of belonging. And there's been a slew of research done that, that shows that, that human beings, all human beings, need just a few things uh, to survive. They need food, they need shelter, and they need to feel like they belong to something larger than themselves. It's, 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 it's fact. Um, and some people get in the workplace, you know, some people get it in their families, but some people don't, a lot of people don't. And I think for, for a number of folks, 
church provides that. Um, and there's always, there's also, and as a good Catholic, you, you can appreciate this. I don't know a good Catholic. Well, um, <laughs> are there good, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We're uh, all flawed. Yeah, we're all, well, we're, you know, original sin. We well, got it. But you're all guilty. I'll tell you that. I'm, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm a 100% Italian Catholic. So oh. the, guilt, the guilt factor it's, is uh, cranked to 11. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's, there's, uh, my wife likes to talk about it, one of the aspects she enjoys in the Catholic Church is when you go in, you know what to do. You know what's coming next. There's a formality to the service. It's very predictable. I think people like stability. People like predictability uh, in uncertain times especially. And the church provides that. When did you first realize that your dad was suffering from addiction? Mm, that's like, a good like w w how old were you when it went from, my dad's not around, he's like not with it, to, oh, something's... Something else is happening. Something else has, has its grip over him. You know, it's, that, it's a hard question to answer because we view addiction differently now than just a few years ago, but certainly, you know, when 35 years ago when I was growing up, um, we just thought that dad drank too much. You know, but there are other folks in the family who drank a lot, and there are other people you'd see from time to time. Yeah. You know, I mean, my dad. You talk about drinking and driving, like he would literally drink and drive. Like I remember being in the car with him, front seat, 73 Pontiac Le Mans, no seat belt. He's got the Budweiser tucked between the two seats and he'd take a swig and he'd drive and we'd stop and he'd take a swig. <laughs> oh, he'd throw the can on the floor, he'd take another one out. So I, I grew up like that with dad literally drinking and driving. Uh, despite my mother, like even back then saying, Lawrence, you really, you can't drink and drive with the kid. And he's like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have two, I had two. But I, I think, oh, no. I think we, we knew it had become a problem when he would drink to the point where he would throw up or, or he'd be passed out for like a day. And that didn't start until we were probably in middle school. Um, oh, and that's it, a hard time for that stuff to oh, do too. And what did not help is he would go up to this place called Tom's Party Shop. And back then... Video poker was legal in South Carolina. And, and my dad, he didn't just have one vice at a time, he had multiple vices. Oh, yeah. Typically they lead to others, but so in addition to his uh, uh, alcohol addiction, he became addicted to video poker to the point where he blew pretty much his entire life savings. Uh, well, I think that's what we see, right? I mean, that addictive personality, oh. that it overlaps. Oh yeah. And a lot of times to get out of one, you've got to replace it with another. Right, and so he would go up to Tom's party shop He'd have his tall boy Budweiser, and he's sitting there playing video poker. And as I got older, my friends would go into the party shop to buy chips or soda or whatever, and they'd see my dad in the back. And by the way, he's driving this lime green 73 Pontiac Le Mans, which is pretty recognizable in the late <laughs> 80s. And it was a small neighborhood. So, you know, he's one got of my- like a Batman villain car. Right! <laughs> and so my friends would come to school, they're like, hey, I saw your dad up at Tom's. You know, and he worked third shift at the post office. So he'd get off work. He'd go to Tom's, he'd drink his beer, play his video poker, and my friends would see him in there, come to school and say, hey, I just saw your dad. And so imagine uh, the embarrassment uh, as, as, as I got older of having my friends see my dad drunk playing video poker before 10 a.m. and coming to school to tell me all about it. And it only got worse from there. You know, I, he, he got in a, a, a little car accident when I was... I was probably in middle school. He runs into this woman's yard and he knocks over a bush and, and he convinces the woman not to call the police by telling the woman he would come and replace the bush with uh, the help of his son who has to get up on a, son, a Saturday morning at o dark 30 to go you know, dig up the bush and replace it. So um, we knew he had some, some issues in middle school, but we didn't know he was a full-on addict until I was in my early 20s. And we tried to get him some help. We, we yeah. staged an intervention before we really knew how to do it. And basically the intervention consisted of us sitting him down and berating him with like stories of his drunkenness and insisting that he get help. And so naturally that didn't work. Yeah, what was the thing that you think um, worked the, the, time, the last time? Because I understand that you did ultimately succeed in helping him yes. change, his, change his path. You can't help someone who's an addict unless they want to actually change their lives. If, when someone decides, you know what, 
I do have a problem. I do want to fix that problem. I am going to get help. Well, that's when you can do it. And the, the, do they have to hit rock bottom? Is there, the, is there a rock bottom thing? You, you have to get pretty close. And my dad was headed for rock bottom. The, the fact that, I mean, he had a couple of DUIs. Uh, he'd Not been, great. Yeah, I mean, he had been detained by the police once or twice. But he had not, thankfully, hurt anybody. Um, he hadn't killed anyone. He hadn't... Uh, and, and the, but that's where it was headed. And that's, what, that's what we saw as, as a family. So for him, he retired from the post office after 40 years as a mail clerk. And what was recreational, pretty heavy drinking, quickly um, turned into binge drinking to a point where he would drink all day Monday blackout, spend Tuesday kind of hungover and recovering, and do it again on Wednesday, Thursday recovery. Friday. So this, is, this became his life. And he was out driving on a, a main thoroughfare there in Columbia, South Carolina, Broad River Road, and I get a call. I'm at the Today Show. Um, and I'd, I'd gotten a call from someone who's, who was in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, um, just so you know, um, your dad is, is developing a, a bit of a reputation in the area for driving drunk. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a matter of time before something bad's gonna happen. So you were at Today when this happened. Oh, sure, sure. So that's also weird, because you're on a national stage. Yeah, yeah, and... yeah, I was in the spotlight. <laughs> Although, you know, that, was, that wasn't really a, a concern. Um, he, he ends up hitting this woman, um, mm. not terribly, uh, but he, there's a fender bender. Yeah. He's coming back from like Wendy's. Uh, doesn't remember any of it, and he hits this woman. Fortunately, we knew the woman, and uh, we convinced her um, that we would take care of, of the damage to the car, and we would get my dad some help. The woman was fine. My dad, thankfully, was fine. But my younger brother and I had a conversation after that, and we were like, you know what? Forget, like, dad, you know, being an embarrassment or, or hurting himself. Like, he's going to kill somebody. Yeah. Um, I mean, my dad was rear-ended by a drunk driver, um, and it, uh, it ended his medical career. So it's like this stuff always, this, this stuff hits me hard when I hear these stories. And we like, didn't want that to happen. Yeah. And, and we knew that's where it was headed. So uh, this time, thankfully, I had, you know, I'd been a journalist for a while, and I'd done a number of stories over the years. In fact, I did a, a big piece a few years ago for Dateline on addiction. Yeah. And how the way that we treat addiction in this country, fortunately, has changed dramatically. The ways in which we can treat it. And so I was armed with some new information. And I, I had a, an assistant at the time whose uh, stepfather uh, ran a nonprofit called Shatterproof. And they dealt with addiction. I was talking to her. She's like, you should talk to my stepdad. And her stepdad had some, some friends who'd been in that space for a while, so I yeah. call him up. I'm, I'm, I'm being good, a good journalist. I'm information gathering, and I this goes on for about a week. I call my brother back. I'm like, you know what? We've got to bring in a professional. Um, and we found a woman, thank God, um, down in Columbia, South Carolina, who who talked me through the steps that we should be taking. And step one was to sit the family down. And to have a therapy session. Without your dad? Without my dad. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. well, this doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but okay, <laughs> this is part of the process. Is that, is, was that partly about trying to wring out some baggage so you don't bring it into the room when, the, when, when there's that time? Ding, 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 John. That, that was part of it. And the other part was to just let us vent about all the ways in which his, his alcohol addiction had, had bothered us almost destroyed our family. And we had not, and you know, and this may be true in your, in your, your family as well, but in my family, you, you, don't, you don't talk about it. You just you bury it. You just pretend it didn't happen. I mean, maybe if it's huge, you might acknowledge it during the holidays, but you certainly don't go talking about it. And so we're, I mean, it's me, it's my younger brother, um, it's my mom, it's, my dad's nephew and his, like there were like six or seven of us in this room and the session's supposed to go like an hour. We're in there for like three hours because people had been bottling all this stuff up for years. Finally, yeah. the therapist is like, we're gonna have to probably do another <laughs> session, guys. Like I've gotta, I gotta go. And she said after the fact that she wanted us to hear how my father's alcohol addiction 
had, re I mean, I had developed this borderline hatred for my dad that I hadn't even realized was there. I was disgusted by him. I, I just... That's one, something that is really, um, a, a good friend of mine, Arthur Brooks, has, written, has talked about this a lot, that disgust. Oh. Disgust is like this poison. It's like, it's, and it's right there with contempt mm -hmm. in relationships where you find yourself rolling your eyes at yes. your spouse or this just like, ugh. And it, it's, it's like a toxin yeah. that you ingest and it takes over the system if you don't get rid of it. And my mother, and we talked about it. My younger brother and I had gotten to a point with her where we used to just tell her all the time, it's like, you know, we're older, we're fine. You're clearly miserable in your marriage. You could just leave him now. Like, we, we, you know, because what we had done unknowingly was we'd written him off years ago. Like we had decided he either wasn't worthy of our continued worry um, or that he was incapable of change. And I left that session on uh, Divine Street in Five Point, South Carolina. I remember it vividly. I left that session. It was, it was an aha moment, as Oprah would say. I left more determined than ever to save my dad. What because was the turn in that moment when I, you went from the disgust to the, to the, to the mission? I saw in that meeting what, what he had done to my younger brother, what he had done to my mother, and what he was doing to me. And here I was, again, you know, pretty successful professionally. I'd gotten married. I was, you know, getting ready to start my own family. And I was having to grapple with these feelings that I had never really addressed before. And it became clear that this disgust, this disdain, this contempt, this borderline of hatred that I had developed, it was a cancer inside of me. And I had to save my dad, not just for my dad, I had to save him for myself. Wow. And so the mission started. And this woman, she helped us in the next meeting develop a strategy to basically kidnap my father <laughs> and sit him down in a room, and we had, we had to write these letters to our dad, because if, if and she, she noticed, like if we were just to talk to him, we were all gonna get worked up and cry and be angry, but if we wrote the, a letter and just read it to him, then he would hear us, and we could make sure that our, our thoughts and our feelings were conveyed in a clear and concise way. And so, on a Sunday morning, we had developed a scheme to pick up my dad to, to tell him that my younger brother needed some help with a project at the house. So first thing Sunday morning. Little white lies little is part of the lie. process. My younger brother goes and picks him up, brings him to the house. He walks in, reeking of booze, and we sit him down. And even in his uh, drunken stupor, he realized that something was, was amiss. Uh, treachery was afoot. <laughs> and we start to read our letters. Did he try to escape? No, he didn't. And we thought, we, we thought he, he would. We, and we said beforehand, we were fully prepared for this to, to take a few times. He sat and he listened to all of us read our letters. And my mother brought up the rear and she read hers last. And, and she um, talked openly and, and wept about how she over the years had lost this man that she knew, this guy that she'd fallen in love with. She didn't know when it happened or how it happened, but his alcohol addiction had essentially ended their marriage years ago and they were roommates. Dad sits there. We had, we had his bag packed for this um, inpatient rehab facility that we had found in Statesboro, Georgia. I said, Pops, I'm gonna throw you in the car and your nephew's gonna drive you three hours to Statesboro, Georgia, and you're gonna be there for at least eight weeks. Um, to save your life. I said it, and the therapist was there. She said something else. The father goes, he picks up his bag, hops in the back of the SUV. He's like, all right, hmm. guess I'm going to Georgia. And we all were looking around like, oh, did that, did that just work? That, that's amazing, because well, you've been through this a couple times, and it's well, like... Well, John, we, <laughs> we found out the next day when we called the rehab facility. We talked to the, the, the doctor down there who was going to oversee, and he's like, uh, I said, how's he doing? He's like, well, Mr. Melvin, 
This isn't uncommon, uh, but when your father showed up, he was um, uh, three to four times the legal limit in, in, in terms of his intoxication. He was lost. Yeah. And um, we asked him about uh, the, the intervention. He didn't remember anything. How did that make, were you like, he, how did that make you feel, all this work? He, he showed up, he was blackout drunk during the intervention. Um, he had the letters with him in his bag. Um, he read the letters. He was deeply moved by him. And, um, but your, your dad's on the road to recovery. And that was, John, what is this, 2023? That would have been 2020? I hadn't had a drop of booze since. It really has been, you know, transformational. Part of the treatment program requires you to go and you have to help him make amends. Yeah. And we each had to do it individually. I flew down, I took a morning off from the show, flew down to Statesboro, Georgia. And um, as soon as I walked in and we hugged and he's crying and I'm crying, and I, I knew then he was a different person. Um, and he, was like the mayor of his treatment program. He's taking me around, he introduced me to all of his, his, his addict friends, as he called them. Um, <laughs> and he was like, oh, you know, Melvin, they call my dad by his last name. Like, Melvin's been talking about you for weeks. He was so proud. Um, he was so proud of me and um, his other two boys. And, you know, it, it was one of those things, John, I was only there for eight hours. And, um, and we walked around, we played frisbee golf. It was very strange. Um, and, but I left there knowing that, you know, uh, he was going to be different. And he has been. I mean, he's just, it, it's really, it's remarkable when you think about a man who had been drinking for 40, he said 45 years, pretty heavily. We didn't realize the extent of it un until he got into rehab. Um, but he would take breaks at work and go out to the car and down a few tall boys. He also used to say, um, I, I, when I went down to visit him in, in Georgia, um, he developed these relationships with the other addicts. And uh, he said to me at one point, he's like, listen, you know, I, I get it. I had, I, I had a problem and it cost me a lot. And there were a lot of things I wish I'd done differently. But I tell you, Craig, you sit in some of these sessions, these guys, I mean, they're really messed up. I was like, Dad, I don't think you're supposed to go judging your addict friends. And he's like, no, no. And he started pointing them out. He's like, that guy, he's only 16. He's been in jail three times. He can't kick the meth. He's like, this woman over here, she's 76. She's been drinking for 50 years. She's on her third husband. Um, and I think it helped him. Knowing I'm not that, so bad. Right, right. That's, that's my dad. He also had a very dark sense of humor. Still does, by the way. Uh, you know, you've talked about this in, in interviews, and, it, and, it's, and it's in the book, uh, Forgiveness. Yes. You've obviously, you obviously had already forgiven your dad when you yes. were on this journey to write this book. Yes. Why is forgiveness important? How did you do it? How did you take that toxicity and, and, and clean it out of your heart? Therapy, I'm sure to answer. I'm a firm believer in, in therapy and have been for a number of years. And uh, over the years, um, my therapists have, have helped, me, helped me understand the importance of letting things go. And you don't, you don't forgive for the other person. You forgive for yourself. And that's, for years, I, I, I've held this bitterness in, in my heart and my soul um, toward my father because I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of forgiveness. I'm not going to let right. him take any credit for any modicum of professional success I've had. I'm not going to have him come up to the show. I'm not going to, no, no, no. This son of a bitch is going to know how much his behavior over the years disgusted me. I'm going to carry it to the grave. And then you grow, you, 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 you grow up. You get older. You have kids of your own. And you, you start to realize that my dad's got fewer days ahead of him than he does behind him. Yeah. That tomorrow's not promised. And that God's been very good to me, John. Um, how dare I not forgive 
when I have been forgiven of so much in my life. And so I, I wrote the book as a love letter to him. I wrote the book to help me heal. I wrote the book to help um, other addicts and other families out there who have someone in their, their family that they think might be too far gone um, as, a, as a little nudge. It's never too late. But the, the forgiveness aspect of it, John, I, I gotta be honest with you, it really has been a gift. Like when I let that go. Like, yeah, what, what changed in your life, oh, like really tangibly? I think it was probably me having a, a son. I think it was my nine-year-old. And you start yeah. spending time with your own kids and you realize parenting's hard. <laughs> it's hard when you're sober. It's hard when you have all the tools at your disposal. And I, I want so much for my son to be proud of me, um, to respect me. I couldn't deprive my dad of that gift. And so I, I really do think it was when I, I became a dad that led to that, that road to forgiveness. Um, and it's just, it's, it's been, and it hasn't just transformed my life and my dad's life, it's transformed our family. I wrote about it in the book. My father took great pride in never having a card payment. He, drew, he, he got a, a, he bought a, a 1970. Just paid cash? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and took hand me down cars from other people in the family. Yeah. My, my father, I'm 44 years old, has not had a car payment my entire life. And There's lessons in that. And, and, and also doesn't have a debit card, mind you. He's a bit of a Luddite in, in a number of ways, but- He's gonna outlive us all. Oh, something. no question. <laughs> but he, about, about three months ago, I was on the phone with him, and he's talking to me about like being out in the yard, working on some car, and I'm like, Pops, not to sound whatever, it's like, you know, Pops, I could help you buy a car. You know, they, they pay me okay at the show. We could probably cobble some money together. He said, no, 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 no. I've offered for years to help him buy a car, and it's like a little game we play. Yeah. I offer, he's like, no, 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 I don't want your money. Yeah. Calls me up. Three weeks ago, it's on a Saturday. Calls me up. I'm dying. And we talk pretty regularly. Yeah. But usually it's, you know, the game's on or there's something. We're talking about something. He calls me out of nowhere. He's like, Pops, everything okay? And he's had some health issues, so I thought it was related to that. He's like, no, nope, no. Nope. Uh, hey, um, you know how you offered to, to, to buy that truck? I said, yeah. He's like, I think I'm ready. And I said to him, he's like, are you, are you sick? I said, what do you mean? He's like, are you dying? Like, is it stage four? I was like, no, I don't think so, unless you know something I don't know. He's like, I just think it's time. I called my younger brother. I was like, dad just called. He's like, he called you about the truck? I said, yeah. He's like, he was over here earlier. Um, he's like, I just saw this Tacoma. I, I'm telling you, this like, is it. It's he's, time. He's like, he, he was over here. He was talking about wanting a new truck, and he was going to call you. I, I thought he'd started drinking again. That's what my younger brother said. Um, and I said, no, he called. And I said to my younger brother, Ryan, I was like, is everything OK? He's like, look fine to me. So I said, Ryan, take him out before he changes his mind. Take him out to look at some trucks. The next day, John, they go to some car dealerships. My brother sends in pictures. The next day, he gets a white Chevy Silverado, 2023. My mother calls. She said, Craig, I have, they've been married for, you know, 40 plus years. Craig, I have never in all my life seen your father this happy. I said, Ma, he's got three sons and grandchildren. <laughs> She's like, I know. I've never seen him this happy. He's driving around town. My father goes three places. He goes to Walmart, my brother's house, and up to the, to, like, the corner store to like, kill time to get away from my mother. She said, he's been driving around town, visiting family. I, I mean, it's, it really is surreal. My brother sends me this video of my, like, my dad in the truck. Every conversation we've had since then, it's been about the truck. He's like, he said, uh, They are like family members. Oh, John. You know? and he's like, he calls me up one day, he's like, you know, they got these cameras in the trucks. And when you back up, the closer you get, the louder and faster it beeps. He's like, it's amazing. He's got my mother in the truck. The it is just, 
It really, and I said to my mom, if I had known it was going to bring him this much joy, we would have done it years ago. And my mom's like, Craig, you couldn't have. He wouldn't have taken it years ago. He's just at a point in his life where he wants to enjoy things. We're going to the beach in a few weeks. We go every summer, we take a week, we go to Hilton Head. And I'm like, Pop said, I can't wait to see you at the beach. Oh yeah, I'm bringing the truck. I can't, you're gonna, I'm gonna take you for a ride in the truck and show you the truck. It's, it's surreal. So I wanna, um, I wanna ask a little bit of a challenging question. Okay. And it's one that a lot of our guests, you know, who have had a, strugg a struggle with their parents and have man become successful, I think. It's this interesting dynamic. You have kids now, you said. Yeah. Um, your kids face a different set of challenges. Right? They face no challenges. <laughs> What's the, the challenge? Well, that is the challenge. Yeah. How do you think about setting them up to succeed? Because in some ways, you know, they don't face challenges. This is a big part theme on our show, that we, our kids are struggling in part with mental health and all these mm -hmm. other issues. And a lot of it is, obviously there's a lot of adversity out there, but sure. there's also a lot of kids who are suffering from a lack of adversity. Yes. So you had all this adversity and your kids, their dad's on TV. Like yeah. they're living a totally different life. How do you navigate that as a father? I, I would maintain, John, that has been, for my wife Lindsay and I, that's been our greatest challenge. Um, we, we talk about it a lot because I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think that, that part of what we're saying as a society in, in terms of you know, uh, suicide rates and, and mental health struggles, um, it's like, I, I grew, you know, we're the same age. I didn't have any friends that were suffering from anxiety. Well, we didn't know it. I mean, Maybe I'm, we, sure, I'm but, sure we, I'm sure yeah. they, they were there, but. But they weren't like the numbers we have today. No, yeah. no, they weren't. I mean, uh, granted, I would contend that a lot of that has to do with the proliferation of social media, um, sure. the internet, but, but that notwithstanding, I mean, that's not going anywhere. So we've got to figure out how to navigate that. And in, in, in rearing resilient children is, is the greatest struggle for us right now. We're doing it a number of, we've, we're trying a number of different things. Going back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, faith. That's going to be one of the, one of the pillars that we're creating. Uh, we also spend a lot of time making sure that our kids are around our extended family who you know, are of modest means and you know, live like regular people, drive regular cars at regular houses, lead regular lives. Um, they spend a lot of time around cousins and, yeah, that's um, great. and we also don't start with yes with them. We tell our kids no a lot. Um, and you know, it's funny cause a couple of, this was last summer. It was last summer, the Olympics, I, I, Beijing was last year. And, um, my son wanted a pair of really expensive sneakers. And I, I said to him what my father always said to me is like, son, we can't afford those. And my, my, that then eight year old son was like, dad, Really, we can't <laughs> afford those sneakers. And then he says to me, he's like, you just got back from China. I know they paid you extra for the Olympics. <laughs> oh, uh, you don't see these are. <laughs> but then I'm like, there was a part of me that was like, I was like a little proud <laughs> that he would connect those dots. We have to deprive them of things. And th not because we can't afford things, but we, we, they need to know that they're not going to get everything. Yeah. Um, so we, we, <laughs> we create artificial barriers. We also have started being selective in terms of the, the children that they hang out with. Because yeah, in our this town, is big. In our town, there are a lot of kids whose you know, dad works at the hedge fund. And they got a basketball court in the house or they've got a tennis court in the backyard. And you know, I, I, my daughter came back from a play date and she's going on and on. I won't use the child's name, but she's going on, on and on about this child's pantry and how their pantry is stocked with all these snacks and candy and she's yeah. just going on and on about the pantry. And I'm like, hey, your pantry's not so bad, by the way, Sybil. But, um, and, 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 and I said to my wife when she got home and Lynn's was like, yeah, they've, they've got a gate in the front and it's a thing. Like, they, Lynn, Sybil goes over and she's like, I think they're rich. And I know the father, and I keep, I'm like, yeah. no, they are, they are. Um, so we try not to have them hang out with her too much, but we try to keep, you know, that's no, it's, it's you, a weird thing. I, like, how do you do it? I mean, we've been pretty careful on the school front Yeah. and you know, when we moved to Texas, uh, one of the reasons we didn't move to Los Angeles, yeah. because frankly, I didn't want to raise my son in the materialism of yeah. LA. It was like, and we've opted not to send him to schools 
that um, were frankly filled with a bunch of rich kids. Yeah, I, no. and, I mean, I'm a capitalist. I'm all for yes, wealth. Yes, same here. But it, it, there's, there's a culture challenge yep. that I think is hard, and it's a new challenge for a lot of people. It's a new challenge, I think, for the, for the country. Because we are getting, we're, we're a lot wealthier than we were 50 years ago. Well, the, but the divide between, I mean, the chasm between those who are and those who are not, that's also never been wider. You just brought up something that I also think is, is important to mention. We deliberately seek out diversity. And not just racial diversity. Geographic diversity, religious diversity, uh, when they're older, you know, the orientation, sexual orientation diverse. It's, it's, it is very important, um, especially for my wife, but me as well that our children are surrounded by people who don't look like them, who don't think like them, who come from backgrounds who aren't like theirs. Because I would, I would maintain that one of the great problems that we have in our society right now is we all live in these echo chambers. We surround ourselves with like-minded people and anytime someone challenges our worldview, we're so sensitive to it and we just don't <laughs> hang out with that person anymore. I thoroughly enjoy having people over, having a nice glass of brown liquor in my basement at my bar with people who are nothing like me. And some of the best conversations that I have are with those people. And it's, I don't know, we don't do that anymore, John. You do it on podcasts, maybe, you know? It's, well, it's, it's funny because I think that we have a lot of focus on the diversity that you can identify from across a room. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a lot of good in that, but there's so much diversity below the surface of what you can know from across the room that we don't spend enough time on. No. People's background, people's perspective, people's di divergence and political views. Yeah, yes. we're, in these, we're in these echo chambers. And you know, as a media guy, how are you thinking about navigating yeah. media consumption, screen time? Well, first of all, full disclosure in my house, I make my children watch the commercials too. Um, and, and my, my son is tired of hearing it because he's heard it his entire life. Anytime he complains about a commercial, I'm like, hey, commercials paid for the TV. Commercial That's paid for the house. Interesting. We watch commercials, son. <laughs> Anytime I catch him trying to fast forward, I'm like, no, 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 no. He's like, but dad, I've seen this commercial. I'm like, That's okay. That's right. We're going to watch it again. Um, my wife and I have decided that we are going to keep those evil devices away from our children as long as humanly possible. Um, they don't have cell phones yet, obviously. Our goal is to hold off until middle school. Um, the, the problem, one of the problems, John, is you've got these other parents yeah. who are giving their kids smartphones in like the fifth grade. Yeah, you go to any, you go to any restaurant, you'll find right down to a three-year-old yeah. holding, holding an iPhone over dinner. No, we, and we, we also and try- look, guilty as charged. We, we did it, we, you know, at the, at the worst moments, sure. it's like Mateo's going crazy. Sure. It's like, just let him play. Digital pacifiers. Mario run. Digital <laughs> pacifiers. We've done it at, rest at restaurants as well. Uh, we've, we've since stopped. What we do now is when they do have some screen time, we limit it. We set the timer on the phone, we're like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever. Timer goes off, there's just not this thing, well, oh, no, come on, dad, no, no. Um, we always know what they're watching. Um, I actually play some video, some video games with him. Um, no, we, we monitor it, and I'll tell you what else we're gonna do. And this is not gonna be a popular opinion. Um, I'm gonna spy on my children. 100%. And they're gonna know <laughs> that, I, I mean, there, there's, there's, there, there's enough technology now where I can see the emails that are going out. I can see what you're scrolling. I can shut down the internet in the house. We're gonna be those parents. Um, because I would, weather, I would rather err on, on the side of, of overprotection than, than being flat out stunned one day when I get a phone call that something terrible has happened to my son or daughter and I didn't know what they were dealing with in their lives. No, I'm, it's, it's, I'm gonna be the Gestapo. There will be no <laughs> expectation of any semblance of privacy in my house. There won't. Um, because there wasn't in, in, in my house growing up. Right, right. All this, pri you know, what, what was this privacy? Right. My, my, I, I remember, like, my, like, I would have the door closed. My mom would swing the door open. She's like, why is the door closed? I'm like, well, I'm 15. You know, I'm on the phone. I'm doing what, you know. Say, we don't close doors. I'm like, all right, fine. Doors wide we, open. We might be conditioning them to live in a surveillance state, but I guess that's, that's a challenge for another time. It's a price they're going to have to pay in my house. 
Um, two more questions for you. Uh, first is, I understand that you started working in television on the local news while you're still in high school. I did. I was a, a high school reporter. I was an Our Generation uh, reporter. I've, I've, I've spent some time over the years trying to get people to take some of those videos down off of YouTube. Yeah, no, the um, internet is forever. It is. Oh, if I had known then what I know now. No, yeah, I, I, I did it for two years, my, my junior and senior year um, at Columbia High School. I would go down to the local TV station and work with a producer to, to uh, b bring stories to life that were of particular interest to teenagers. This was the station's attempt to try to reach a younger audience back in the... <laughs> You got 1990s. recruited. Uh, yeah, I went down and auditioned. I remember vividly driving in my dad's 1973 Pontiac Le Mans. I drove down to Richland Fashion Mall one afternoon, and, and, um, and there were other kids there competing, and I, 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 they picked me, which was uh, quite surprising. And then when I was there, I, I did a story on my favorite teacher, Mike Fanning. Uh, who's, by the way, a state representative now in South Carolina, but back then he was my AP government teacher. <laughs> and I did a story on him, and the news director, unbeknownst to me at the time, entered it into this Associated Press competition, and I won. And I was 16 or 17, and I said to the news director at the time, I was like, did nobody else enter? He's like, no, no, it was a pretty good story, Craig. I was like, well, I don't think it was, but okay. And we go to this banquet, my family and I, and I'm surrounded by all these journalists, and that was the first time where I, I thought, wow, People get paid to tell stories and ask questions. This is a, this is a career. And I was introduced to journalism, and, and that was when the seed was planted. It's one of these things that I, I'm going to say, I'm pro-child labor on this front. I That's think, right. <laughs> same here. You know, and yeah, so are you going to, how are you going as a dad to get your kids to engage in their interests in a work context before, before they go off to college and you know, get lost in all this nonsense that takes forever and you don't get, you don't become an adult until you're 26 or whatever yeah. they're saying now. It's a good question. My daughter's still pretty young. She's yeah. six. You got a little bit to go. But my son has, has come with me. He's a huge Kansas City Chiefs fan. And I, I interviewed Patrick Mahomes last season with Travis Kelsey. And I thought, it's like, oh, you know, maybe he'll want to go. And I mentioned it to him and he was like, what, are you serious? I was like, yeah, you could come and do the, he's like, oh, dad, I, I mean, he was, I was like, well, you got to get up early and you got to, I'm thinking he'll back out. The kid was like a pig in slop and I asked him some questions and asked like decent questions. And I didn't, I, I didn't spoon feed him the questions. And then I brought him in a few weeks ago to bring your kid to work day. And it was the first time where I saw like a legitimate, in, what seemed to be a legitimate interest and like what I did, like he, and he's always been curious and he's always been an avid reader. Um, when he's at that age where the stuff's starting to really I, take I, off. Yeah, I think so. And he, he did this thing with Jimmy Fallon and- uh, <laughs> his, his go to work with dad day well, is a little- That's a little different, <laughs> true. But, but he, yeah. Lester Holt invited him to interview Jimmy Fallon with him. And he's done some stories on Nightly News Kids Edition. Uh, he's done a few interviews. And so he goes and he does this thing with Jimmy and I reach out to Lester afterwards, and I said, Lester, thank you so much for being so kind to my son. And Lester's son is in the business. He's a news anchor in Chicago. He was in New York for a while. And Lester's like, Craig, but your son's a natural. And I know, because my son used to come to work with me when he was a kid. And you see how it ended up for him. So you either keep him away or know what you're in for. So that was probably the last time he's gonna be able to come to the show. Because I want him to get a real job, John. Oh, so you're like, you know what? If you want to, you're gonna, you're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna have to like fight your way back. I, 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 med school would be great. Law school would be great. Um, I guess if he ends up doing this, it's not the worst thing in the world. But I don't want him to do it because I do it. You know, I want yeah. him to, to to discover it on his own. And if he does, then yeah, that's fine. I've enjoyed this. You should send me a bill. This has been very, <laughs> this has been therapeutic. It's kind of right. cathartic. You changed the course of your family's life with those, with that intervention. You know, you played that, you played that role with your family. We ask this question of every guest. Um, you know, 
This is called Dad Saves America because I think that dads play this role in our families, in our kids' lives, and then in our communities, and that that is the way that we ripple out to the country. Oh, I like that. It's from the bottom up, not from the top down. Like the change, that. I think, actually happens. How do you think about your role in the American story? That's a, that's a big last question. I just, I, you know, what motivates me um, I don't really think about my role in the American story. I think about my, my role in my family story, which I guess is part of the American story, so I guess you could extrapolate. I want to be a good model for my children and my nephews and my cousins. And my, I, I want to be um, the kind of person that they want to grow up to be like, not because I'm on television every morning, not, not because you can watch me on the Today Show. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that life that I live when the little red light's not on. You know, I, I want them to see me being a good father, being a good husband, being a good friend. Um, because I did, that's something that I didn't really have growing up. So I had to find it in other places. So that if I, but if I can model that to my family, that's how we break what for, for our family has been a generational curse. But I gotta be honest with you, as we sit here, I've never been more optimistic um, about it for my family and for other families as well as a result of the work that you're doing, as a result, hopefully, of the work that I'm doing with the Dad's Got This series. Um, I, I think that we are celebrating the mod modern dad. And, That's right. And that goes a long way, John. Dad save America. <laughs> Craig, thanks yeah. for being on the show. It's been a ton of fun. Yeah. And um, it's been this, great to hear your story. This has gone a lot better than I thought it would. <laughs> Craig, be, well, because, you know, it's I don't all about really, expectations well, management, I Craig. Don't, I don't really <laughs> like to talk about, uh, I don't really like to talk to strangers, quite frankly. <laughs> and so I didn't really know you. And they sent an email, and my assistant and, and, and the folks at NBC, they were like, this, this John guy, he seems like he knows what he's doing. You're right. You're good at this. Thank you. I'm going to use that in fundraising use tapes that, well, for a long time to come. Oh, my great, great, great. <laughs> Thanks, Appreciate it, man. Yes. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Craig Melvin. Be sure to check out his book, Pops. We'll put a link down below. My main takeaway from this conversation was the importance of forgiveness. Forgiving someone doesn't just help them, it helps you. Holding on to anger and resentment only tethers us to the past. Forgiveness is a necessary step in that healing process so we can look forward to the future. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends and family. And be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes that play an essential role in overcoming the challenges we all face together. And now, I leave you with a newsworthy dad moment. Well, in case you guys haven't figured out, today is National Take Your Child to Work Day, and uh, here it's Put Your Kids to Work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see your right face, Delano Melvin. Oh. Well, heat building. We're looking at severe storms down to the south, and we're looking at Dad sweating uh, for the <laughs> afternoon. That's what's going on around the country. Nice job. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh, well done, son. <laughs>